2, the Security Pacific Bank in La Habra, California. Police didn't know the name of the gunman who walked in that morning, but a string of robberies had made his disguise and M.O. all too familiar. A cold attitude and a female wig had become trademarks of Stephen Moreland Red. Freeze! Please move away from there. Now! You, get up. I want to see your hands. Give me all your money. Now! I'm not kidding. Turn around. Go. Turn around. You think I'm joking over here? Move it! Won't anybody move? Where's the toe that was at this window? You want me to pop a customer? You tell us I'm becoming an endangered species. Turn around. His M.O. Was, was unique in that he was one individual who came in and took down the whole bank. Don't be looking at me. Don't move. Don't go out there, folks. It's dangerous outside. And the alarm came into the dispatchers, and uh, two of our patrol people, Sergeant Tom Machado and uh, Corporal Jack Reese, were having coffee at a, at a coffee shop that was about a block away from Security Pacific Bank. And they came down the street and parked. Corporal Jack Reese followed him through an alley and over by an apartment complex. Oh, please! Stephen Red has always been a fighter. He even tried to break out of prison, but a bullet 
to the shoulder stopped him cold. Red was paroled in April 1993 after serving 11 years. He failed at one job after another, and police say he was soon back to his old tricks, armed robbery. According to police, his first target was a drugstore at a shopping center in Orange County. Two months later, on May 31st, 1994, they say he returned, wearing his trademark disguise and acting crazy. they'd spotted a burglar, they gave chase. Look at that car, we can stick with them all night long. Chase wasn't in vain because the two witnesses were able to get the license plate number. That led police to Stephen Red's apartment. Inside, they found an arsenal of weapons and an order form for books on how to make rockets, bazookas, and bombs. Alarmed detectives began an intensive search for Red, but he successfully hid out until the night of July 18, 1994. That night, manager Tim McVeigh and a checkout clerk, we'll call Jane, took their normal dinner break together in the storeroom of a Yorba Linda supermarket. When you get married, I'm not bringing you dinner anymore. Not just because I'm getting married, I don't get any more leftover meatloaf sandwiches. I thought you were my friend. I am, but she'll be your wife. Mm. You better like her meatloaf better. our last checker went home. After she left, it was just Tim and I in the store. Jane, I have to go back to the stock room. I'll be right back. Okay. As he left to the back, a man came in and uh, scared me right away. He had a wig on that did not look like normal hair. Seventy-nine cents. I 
guess you'll have to break that. I remember looking at his waist to see if I could see a gun because he was so, there was so much scariness to him. communities. And it was here two months ago that Denny Pleasy, a 38-year veteran of the Brinks Armored Division, was robbed and gunned down. He was a husband, a father, and a grandfather. My father was one of the greatest people in the world. He had seven granddaughters and he loved all of them just the same whether they were grouchy or in a good mood. I think he even liked them even when they were the grouchiest the best because <laughs> they would climb up into his chair and want to be hugged and kissed and grandpa was always there. He wasn't always very cautious. My mom was always having to tell him to watch your backside, honey, you know, keep, keep an eye out. Listen for what's going on around you. And um, my dad had told me that, you know, his time was short and that I would have to take care of my mom someday and that the robberies have been getting a little bit more, the robbers have been more brazen, more bold. And I told my dad to protect himself. You know, do something to protect yourself, dad. You know, wear a bulletproof vest, you know, do something. And he told me that that's not the way he would be going. Last August, weeks after Denny Pleasy returned from summer vacation, he went back to work. And on September 6th, he started his day like any other. Uh, he was in a happy mood. He had just uh, spent a weekend with his uh, wife and his grandchildren. He loved his family very much, and uh, we suspected nothing. We pulled up to our usual stop, uh, Manufacturers Bank, in uh, Beverly Hills. Mr. Please got out of the armored car. He went into the bank in order to uh, get uh, admitted into the bank to make his there. At that point, he was confronted by a, a man who he never even saw, a man that walked up behind him as he's waiting to be uh, led into the bank, and a man who shot him in the back of the head and killed him. Well, shortly thereafter, a Hispanic lady came out and started speaking Spanish, which I do not speak, and I told her I tried a motion that I didn't understand. She went like this. Uh, I immediately hit uh, the siren and alarms in the truck. Beverly Hills Police uh, responded uh, in 30 seconds. Uh, they one ran to the door and opened the door and reported a man down. 60-year-old Denny Pleasy died at the scene of the crime. A witness who saw the shooter helped create this composite drawing. The crime was reported on television. Then police got a break when this man came forward with new information. He'd seen the shooter just a week earlier in the bank lobby. It was a week prior to the shooting when I was walking in the building and I noticed two individuals standing there. I thought it was funny that uh, they had stopped talking immediately as I entered the building. Um, when I saw the crime a week later on television, I realized it was the same two individuals I had seen. So I notified uh, Beverly Hills Police immediately and gave them the second composite of the individual. He recognized this composite. 
police now believe this similar looking composite could be a second suspect. It was a tragedy the way it happened. It should not have happened. It's an unfortunate situation. Uh, the people that did this kind of a crime planned it, anticipated what was going to happen, and they did it. I just, I can't believe that they would shoot down my dad for such, such a little amount of money when he would have just handed over the bag. And they, they shot down my dad, my children's grandfathers, my mother's husband, and it's someone that we can never, ever replace. The cold-blooded murder of a loving father and a hard-working man is always hard to deal with. That family needs your help. So please, take a close look at the few clues the Beverly Hills police have to go on. Police say this composite is of the shooter. He appears to be Caucasian in his mid-30s, 5'9 to 5'10, medium build, with a long, narrow face, neatly styled dark hair, dark mustache. Police say he blended into the neighborhood. The accomplice, also in his 30s, 5'8, 180 pounds, stocky build. He appears to be of either Hispanic or Middle Eastern descent, with dark straight hair, large dark mustache, and dark thick eyebrows. Both men were seen wearing long sleeve white dress shirts, dark ties, and black pants. If you recognize these men or have any information about this crime, please call us now, 1-800-CRIME-TV. Your tips can help us put two killers behind bars. There's one other clue police have to go on. The robbers got away with a Brinks bag just like this one. They probably disposed of it somewhere. So if you know anything about this crime, make that call. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I was just trying to be nice to him. And I they really were waiting. He's letting me use my phone. Sure, it's over there on the chair. Opening the door to one of America's most wanted. If our justice system worked better, I wouldn't be telling you about Timothy Pay. In 1982, Pay was convicted here in California of sexually abusing a minor, then spent just four months in jail. Two years ago, Pay was charged in Buffalo, New York with sexual contact with a child. That case is still pending. Six months later, Pay became a suspect in a brutal rape in Buffalo. That's when he skipped town. Would you try walking in a straight line for me, keeping one foot in front of the other? Pay resurfaced this spring in Chico, California, when he was arrested for drunk driving. He could have been sent back to Buffalo. But authorities there decided not to seek extradition. Pay was released. Last July, Chico police arrested Pay again, this time for trying to break into a young woman's apartment. But the charge was reduced to a misdemeanor. Pay walked out of custody on July 13th. The next afternoon, police say Pay was cruising the quiet streets of Chico. College student will call Sarah was working in town that summer to raise money for her senior year at Chico State. I had just gotten back home from work in the grocery store and had gone to go pick up my mail. Hi. Looks like you got your hands full. <laughs> you live here? Yes. Yeah. So does a friend of mine. Her name's Nancy, uh, I'm terrible with last names, and I don't remember what unit. You know any Nancy's here? Mm, no, sorry. Thanks, anyway. Sure. He seemed like a nice person. He was very friendly. Coming! Who is it? Hi again. some help here. I can't find Nancy's apartment, but I have a phone number. Think I could use your phone and give a quick call? Won't take more than a minute. Sure, it's over there on the chair. Thanks. I'm just trying to be nice to him. I had no idea who he was. And I was, you know, being neighborly and used letting him use my phone and it's dead. No doubt, Tom. That's weird. It was working this morning. 
It's fine. I heard about a party tonight. Why go? I can't. I have a lot to do. That's what I think. I'd like you to leave. What are you doing? I want a party tonight with you. Get out of here! Shut up! He was hitting me on my face. It was mostly the left side of my face. It was just pounding. And then he was choking me at the same time and smothering me with pillows. The more I fought him off, the more he hit me and beat me and was choking me. And, and, just, and then I was unconscious through the rest of it. I don't remember being raped at all. But when I got to the hospital and they did the tests, I knew for sure. I was afraid to get out of the closet at first. And when I finally did get out of the closet, I mean, the first thing I did was go lock the door. And then I called the police, and then they were there within a matter of a few minutes. He punched me in the face. My eye was swollen for about two or three days. It was swollen shut. The whole side of my face was swollen on the left side. I had marks on my throat. They're still there. I have no idea why Timothy Pay beat her like that. As I said, she cooperated uh, with his demands as best she could, but he still beat her. Just four hours later, police say Pay was on the hunt for another victim. She was also brutally raped. <laughs> when Sarah ID'd Pay, Police asked for an arrest warrant. Because of Pay's record, bail was set at $1 million. Yeah, you sure? These are the mug shots police showed Sarah. Although police were unable to track him down, Pay turned himself in after the Chico Enterprise record put his photo on the front page. Pay's defense attorney requested an in-person lineup. Another ordeal for Sarah. During the lineup, he had a smirk on his face. It's just unbelievable how he could have a smirk on his face because of what he did. It just made me very upset. Deputy District Attorney Robert Saria took the case at the arraignment, but neither Saria nor the judge were aware the arrest warrant specified a $1 million bail. Any recommendations on bail, counsel? Your Honor, in this instance, given the nature of the charges and the fact that the defendant has no steady source of income, I recommend bail be set at $100,000. Granted. Thank you, Your Honor. Robert Saria thought $100,000 would keep pay behind bars. Two days later, he was in for a shock. We did not know that he had a brother out of state who was a physician who had access to that kind of cash and could actually get 10% bond or $100,000 in property. We then immediately filed papers in the municipal court asking the judge to reevaluate the bail and deny him bail based upon a showing that he was a, a danger to society. He did not appear two weeks later for his court appearance, so Timothy Pay is now on the streets and women are in danger. I feel responsible. I evaluate cases differently than I did because of Timothy Pay. I was very upset at the law enforcement and the um, criminal system because they allowed something like this to happen. Because of a mistake, I'm afraid. I don't like to go out at dark by myself. I just want to get him caught and put back where he belongs. Timothy Pay is charged with two counts of rape, sexual abuse, and contempt of court. 
Timothy Pay seems to think he's above the law, but I don't think so. Tonight, let's give him a reality check. And when he's caught this time, there'll be no bail. Pay sometimes lives off of girlfriends. When he does work, it's usually in a fast food restaurant. He makes friends easily. Police say Pay's a smooth talker. And that's what catches his victims off guard. He obviously comes across nice and obtains their trust and then beats them and rapes them. Please, don't let it happen to another woman. You know where Timothy Pay is tonight. Call our hotline. The number is 1-800-CRIME-TV. And remember, you don't have to tell us your name. Now, here's an update on some of our recent cases. You spotted Smash Wooten in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Police say Wooten was part of a gang shootout that killed a seven-year-old girl. They were, of course, scared, so they were panicking, they were screaming, some were crying. One of the children had said, she's bleeding, and at that point, she just collapsed. He's still on the run, maybe traveling to Connecticut or New York. So tonight, a special alert to our viewers in those areas. There's also new information on Christopher Goins, charged in Richmond, Virginia, with the brutal slaying of a man, his wife, and three of their children. He walked into the room, point blank range, just started to shoot. Look closely. This is the girlfriend police believe Goins is traveling with. Her name is Monique Littlejohn. She's charged with a series of drug crimes of her own, and she could lead police to Goins. If you've seen them, you know what to do. We also profiled Jane Stromer, a brilliant college professor convicted of raping two young students. He broke out of prison in North Carolina. There's so many things I wish I could say, but we never got to say to each other. And I don't know if I'll ever have a chance to talk to him again or ever see him again. You called in a lot of tips, but Stromer managed to hide from the manhunt. Here are new pictures of Stromer. Take a good look. If you've seen him, call 1-800-CRIME-TV. Now, there's a child out there who needs your help tonight. So please, watch closely this week's Missing Child Alert. Six-year-old Michael Anthony Hughes was kidnapped from Choctaw, Oklahoma on Monday, September 12th. Police say witnesses saw this man, Franklin Floyd, abduct Michael at gunpoint from the Indian Meridian Elementary School. Floyd was arrested this Thursday in Louisville, Kentucky. He claims he had nothing to do with Michael's kidnapping and doesn't know the boy's whereabouts. The FBI and police are checking every lead from Oklahoma to Kentucky to find Michael Hughes. If you've seen Michael, call 1-800-CRIME-TV. Child molesters and rapists are very often repeat offenders. There are programs all across the country to try and help them, from counseling and therapy to hormone treatments. But the truth is, many of them just don't work. Now a controversial idea is being suggested by the sex offenders themselves. Surgical castration. That's right, castration. It's an age-old concept. And on the surface, it may sound like a good idea. But as our correspondent Lena Nozizwe found out, castration may be a double-edged sword. And I want to warn you, this story is not suitable for younger viewers. I was very sexual as a child. The first time I ever forcibly made somebody do something sexual, I was eight or nine years old. I had a hammer in my hand, I just threatened. Paul Redondo Gonzalez grew up to be the kind of criminal that's America's most hated, both inside and out of prison. A sexual predator who targets the most defenseless victims, children. How many children have you molested? Too many to remember. How many children have you raped? There's only three or four of those. It's just whether, you know, I'm just hesitant to say so. But, you know, it's just, it's not, not like to think about. But
but he has plenty of time to think about it in his jail cell in Midland, Texas, where he's locked up once again, this time for molesting two young brothers. You can't stop it. I can't him. control it. Where does this urge come from? My penis up, my testicles up. It starts down there, and that's got to go, or nothing else is going to help. The 36-year-old repeat offender believes he's found an answer to his dark obsessions in these headlines, an extreme solution that's been praised in publications ranging from Texas Monthly to The New Yorker. Castration, an unspeakable cure for unspeakable crimes. I believe it's absolutely necessary is to undergo surgical castration. That's the beginning. Officially, Texas prisons won't allow inmates to be castrated. It's an area fraught with potential litigation and abuses. But Gonzalez joins a handful of the state's imprisoned sex offenders pushing for it anyway. Houston attorney Paul Looney represents seven other such inmates. Who want to be castrated. That have been through the therapy process over and over again. They have been unable to control their compulsive disorder. Compulsive disorders that have driven some offenders to unbelievable lengths. If you can imagine a person using a broken Coke bottle, a, a tin can lid, a table knife, to perform surgery on themselves, to remove their testicles, because nobody will make it medically available for them. That's the level of desperation. What man would do that? What woman would use a coat hanger to abort a fetus? Desperate people behave in desperate when it's done professionally, the procedure is relatively quick and simple. A surgeon removes the testicles from the scrotum. They're normally replaced with prosthetics like these. We need to elect some, some uh, uh, politicians that have testicles to allow the inmates that need to have theirs removed to access that. Meet Texas State Senator Teal Bivens. The Republican cattle rancher is pitching a bill that's already died once in committee that would allow repeat offenders to get castrated behind bars. This is a very emotional issue. It's one that uh, we as, quote, a civilized nation have felt we shouldn't have to look at. What's more barbaric, to allow an innocent child to be molested by someone who we know is going to reoffend, or to allow that offender to undergo treatment so that, that that molestation can be prevented. I think that, that the crime is far more barbaric than the treatment. Bivens was inspired to write the bill after seeing impressive studies on castrated sex offenders in European countries most of us would not consider barbaric, including Denmark, where 1,000 men were physically castrated between 1929 and 1970. The reoffense rate was just over 2%. While the reoffense rate for sexual predators is usually more than 50%, so on the surface it appears to work. We need to pursue alternatives to incarceration, and this is one that has been demonstrated over many years to work. It sets a nasty precedent that we start snipping away at, at human tissue to, to control uh, behavior. Uh, it, it's like uh, the prefrontal lobotomy operations that began to be used for all sorts of stuff. Dr. Michael Cox runs a sex abuse treatment program at Baylor College of Medicine in Texas. He is suspect of castration and of the statistics that show it works. The studies, the old European studies, look on the surface to be very seductive, but uh, I don't trust them on methodological grounds, how the, how the studies were, were planned and, and, and carried out. So I came to Denmark to find out for myself to see if the home of Hans Christian Andersen is in fact the home of a miracle cure. Or is it a fairy tale? What we found in Denmark was worse than a fairy tale. It was a nightmare of abuse. It took place here, inside the gray walls of the Herstevester prison, just outside of Copenhagen, where nearly a third of the castrations were performed. Dr. Heidi Hansen is the medical director. I say what we do in Denmark when we castrate a person, you can compare it to cutting the hands off the thief, but you must include that those hands were used to strangle people. But did the voluntary castration go too far? More than two-thirds of the 1,000 castrated men never committed a sex crime. Included in that number are people who did commit crimes, but even people who fantasize about committing crimes could be castrated. So you're saying somebody who just thought about sex crimes was castrated? 
Yes, yes they could, and that is why doctors today call it a cabinet of horrors. How can you justify that? I will not defend it. I cannot defend it. But at the same time, I want to say it was a different time. Dr. Hansen's predecessor, Dr. George Stirrup, presided over the castrations at Hearst of Esther. He was so well known for the operations, an inmate fashioned this caricature of the doctor, complete with medical bag and saw blade. Of the hundreds castrated, Dr. Hansen admits only 21 committed serious sex crimes. The rest of them committed crimes such as flashing, exhibitionism, homosexuality with somebody who was under 21 at the time. To be homosexual in, in Denmark in this time, the police couldn't come to your working place, to your house. Eric's name is within the cabinet of whores. His crime was having a long-term relationship with an underage lover. That's because they say a homosexuality was a sickness. Eric says Dr. Stirrup recommended the castration cure and told him getting the operation was the only way he could get out of prison quickly. Many feel that this is the danger of so-called voluntary castration, that inmates in the U.S. would be forced to go along with the procedure in order to get less prison time. Eric says that's how he felt, so he went ahead with it. The, uh, the first I do, I remember, I take my hands down and look and, uh, and uh, I scream. He says the doctor pronounced him healed. I'm not sick. I have never been sick. And then I, I, I think they have killed, they have murdered me. For his follow-up, Eric says there was no medicine and no treatment. But three months later, he was set free. And because he was never imprisoned again, Dr. Stirrup was able to include him in that impressive list of sex offenders who did not reoffend. What would you say there? I don't think I can apologize for the medical world back then, and I think maybe 50 years from now, people will look back on me and say, why did they do that? Dr. Cox says cases such as Eric show why Denmark's castration statistics are not to be believed. With that, that kind of uh, research and design, with that kind of motley crew of, of uh, uh, people castrated, uh, it's, it's hard to kind of ferret out what is working with whom and under what conditions. The Danish government put an end to the physical castrations in 1970, in part because of the abuses. Denmark still castrates men, but now it's done chemically. The most decisive advantage of a chemical castration is that it is reversible. Since 1989, only 15 inmates at Hurstavester have undergone the treatment, which all but eliminates the male hormone. Among them is Reuben, a repeat offender who sexually assaulted 27 women. He now takes a combination of the drugs twice a month. Very personal question, it's a personal story. What was sex like before and after? The biggest thing is that before I want to have sex two times a day. Now I don't care if I get anything. How often do you think of sex now? I never think about sex. Never? Never. The 27-year-old former truck driver says he's given away the pornography he's able to buy at the prison store, and he stopped watching the pornographic movies piped in on the prison's TV system. By the time you're done with an inmate who comes here, you want to send them out asexual, homosexual, heterosexual. What have you created here? You ever hear that? I'd like to reverse the question and say what kind of people are sent here. I hope they're a little bit more normal when they leave here than when they arrive. Well, what about the U.S.? Well, many politicians are reluctant to get into castrating inmates because they feel it's cruel and unusual punishment. There are also concerns about the potential of abuse. Right here in Texas, uh, not but uh, a year or two ago, they were talking about population control via castration. Any kind of violent crime, uh, they would use castration, thereby wiping out uh, that part of the population's ability to reproduce. I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, it began to sound like uh, uh, Germany in, in the uh, 30s and in the, in the 40s. Dr. Cox believes a more humane approach is the so-called chemical castration. The drug Depper Provera is used on a limited basis in his treatment program here in the U.S. It seems like a compromise, but some say it's not enough. Lowering is not going to do it. I've known people that have been, you know, been under Depper Provera and have told me that they've continued their behaviors. I'm not willing to take that risk. Even without the help of the state, Gonzalez is pursuing the castration. He says all he needs is a doctor and money for the operation. Are you asking for any kind of deal? 
in return for castration? None. I've been offered what I've been offered. I've accepted it. I've demanded the castration. I'm fighting for the castration. I don't think we have the answer. I don't think we have adequate research. I think the, the, the prospect of this precedent is frightening to me. It, it, can, it, can, it can lead to some outrageous uh, abuses. When you walk out of prison, the charge you're in for now, and you don't get castrated, what can society expect? Well, my biggest fear is that um, nothing will change and that uh, more than likely there will be more uh, victims in my life. On Monday, Texas Senator Teal Bivens will be introducing the castration bill at the state legislature. And if it becomes law, offenders like Paul Gonzalez will get their wish. There's more when we come back, so stay with us.